Frequency is the same stat in every two groups, yes. Even if you're in a 40 milligram dose, yes. Uh, is neurochiropractic effective by chemotherapy? Yes, if it's effective, no, if it's not. Uh, frequency of sandostatin can be given every two weeks, yes. Even if you're at a 40 milligram dose, yes. Uh, is neurokinin level affected by chemotherapy? Yes, if it's effective. No, if it's not by effective. I, I agree effective. with all of that. Yes, if it okay. works. Okay. <laughs> yes, if it works. Document, uh, documentation for Infinitor shows to watch blood levels if you're a SEGA patient. Uh, what are the unpublished levels for PNETS patients, and how do I let my doctor know what my blood level is? Uh, it, does your doctor, is your doctor, whoever this is, is your doctor participating in a trial and, and knowing that, or is your doctor treating you off trial? My doctor is not participating in the trial, and he is in uh, an overall arm trial, so I'm not conducting Okay. Comes under the impression that Centipore has a level. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm not aware of it. No, no. Yeah, they were used only in transplant patients. Right. Was it used in the trial? Okay. Yeah, and, and he needs to do the measurement. I mean, the things that affect uh, your dosing of Affinitor is if you have renal insufficiency. And, and so it has to, be, uh, has to be adjusted. Or if you get, develop impairment of renal function, it has to be adjusted under those uh, circumstances. The other things that, uh, the little warnings that I get, the little, the little he's squashing me. The, the, <laughs> I've had this trouble with him for a long time in my life. I never let him... Moving right along. <laughs> Moving right along. We'll talk later. Okay. All right. Okay, Boudreaux, here it comes, baby. Uh, primary in the ileum, blood test, markers normal, serotonin normal, metastasis to the liver normal. Should I take out my primary? That was for you, sir. Yes. Yes. Uh, moving right along. How does neurokinin value... Greater than 50 relate to foregut, midgut. It's never been done in foregut. We don't know the answer. We're doing that answer. And so far, it ain't been real, real big. Moving right along next. Uh, Are you all oh. happy with that answer? <laughs> yeah, we don't. It, neurokinin A works for midguts, period. Yeah. That's simple. Okay. Uh, all cancer patients have depression, Dr. Vinick. Some who come to see you more depressed than others. Please, please address the special mental and emotional hurdles that carcinoid and NETS patients face with all their functioning hormones. Uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll summarize this for you very quickly. The, it, it doesn't relate to any of the other functioning hormones that we've measured, and it doesn't relate to the pancreastatin level or the chromogranin A level. It relates to the serotonin. And everybody used to poo-poo the serotonin, but you heard today that they're not poo-pooing it anymore, and that paper by Howe and colleagues suggests that it's going to be an important measure in not only carcinoid, but also in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Let me explain it to you very quickly, very quickly. What happens is if the tumor is making serotonin, it sucks up the precursor, 5-hydroxytryptophan. 5-hydroxytryptophan is the only substance that you can make serotonin out of in the brain. So you have to get it from the, uh, the blood into the brain, and it, it can't go there to make the serotonin, the brain which keeps you cool. You know, serotonin in your brain keeps you cool. That's serotonality. So if you don't have that precursor, because it's all going into form of serotonin by the tumor, that's what's causing your depression. You do get depressed with other cancers, there's no doubt about it, but it's not a serotonin-related mechanism. Okay. okay. Uh, Phil, uh, I've heard some docs say you should take the primary out, some say you can wait until you get into trouble. What's the answer? Amen. Brother. Okay. Uh, one to me. Bioactive component of lac raspberry yeah, treatment. Corollary to that. Yeah, sure. The other benefit of taking out a primary at this moment before somebody is really in trouble is you can do all sorts of things with that tumor, with live tumor that you can't do with it if you have it taken out emergently in hospital XYZ where they throw it in a bucket of formalin and pickle it in formaldehyde and have killed it. A lot of the studies that we like to do can only be done on live fresh tissue while it's still alive and it dies within a few minutes of taking it out. Okay. And, and tell them that that helps you predict the... And that helps us in a predictive way, perhaps, how to plan future therapies. Right. Okay, three questions real quick about black raspberry. Uh, bioactive component of black raspberry treatment unknown. 
not not in the egalic acid and not in the seeds. Comments about the effective of therapies that inhibit hedgehog, I'm not sure about. Activate not signaling, that is the, uh, Herbert Chen's work. Dr. Chen is working on valproic acid. As you know, we have a study going on that we're looking at putting people on black raspberry and valproic acid, keeping their valproic acid level between 50 and 100, more towards 100, and treating them with one gram per kilo per day of the black raspberry powder. We don't use the seeds, we make a tea out of it. And those studies, Dr. Uh, Chen just published his valproic acid paper, uh, valproic acid by itself, limited number of patients, but a, a nice response. Nine patients. Uh, nine patients, okay. Black raspberry powder, is it for everyone? Absolutely not. Uh, when do, I like to use it, I, I test for it in my lab. So if you come to Phil, he takes out your tumor, he gives me your tumor, I'll test it against black raspberry, I'll test it against valproic acid, and I'll test it against the combination of the two. Those are the people I really recommend black raspberry. The other group that I recommend are people who are pooping themselves to death, uh, who have unremitting diarrhea. For some reason, whether it's the pectin or whatever, I don't know, that it seems to, to fix diarrhea. Uh, last question, CGA from Quest is normal, neurokine and pancreastatin from ISI are normal, as is 5-HIA. New growth is seen on CT and verified by biopsy. Is there anything to look for in terms of markers for monitoring? The one thing you didn't tell me is where the hell is your, your primary tumor? Where did it come from? So anybody want to tell me where the primary tumor came from? Heliocecal, so it's a yeah. mid-gut. Um, you're one of the rare people, I gotta tell you, uh, to have three negative, or four negative markers and progression on CT scan, you ask yourself the question, it, it is what's progressing a, a mid-gut carcinoid. I, I would uh, maybe ask them to biopsy it and see what's going on, or it went from the well-differentiated mid-gut carcinoid and it's now getting into that aggressive phase where the KI-67 runs up to greater than 20, it becomes less differentiated and, and you're about to get into trouble. MIBG scan. Uh, MIBG scan might but help he, you. No, but he's all, already he said he's scan positive. It's increasing. It's growing. No, no, CT. Did you say CT is CT growing? is increasing. Okay. Post scan negative. All right, uh, Dr. Vinick, uh, what are the biomarkers that signal bone mets? Should patients be tested with these markers prophylactically once a year to see if you have bone mets, and if so, when should that start? Okay, uh, they, they are very simple markers. You'd ask for a bone alkaline phosphatase. They're always doing the alkaline phos, but they don't ask specifically for bones. They ask specifically for bone alkaline phos. Hydro Called an isoenzyme. An isoenzyme. You ask for N-telopeptide. N that where I wrote that NTX. N-telopeptide. T-E-L-L-O peptide, P-E-P-T-I-D-E. Uh, right. uh, and then we also like to get hydroxyproline. Those are the three markers. I do them the moment I see the patient, so we start the, a baseline measurement. And then I will do it on a six months or an annual basis to see when, where it appears. People always ask, do I have to have pain? You can have metastases without pain. And uh, do they respond? Uh, Dr. Waltering and I are very aggressive with the use of bisphosphonates, so we use bisphosphonate therapy. And I gotta tell you, I love what? Oh, no, 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 I was gonna say, write those down. Uh, 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 we really like the use of uh, the uh, Exgeva or Zometa. We think that even then those people who have bony mets, it like, like stops bony mets in their tracks. Okay, Phil. Uh, why not remove the primary if you got greater than 60% tumor burden in the liver? Uh, do you recommend taking Prilosec one time a day? Why do we take it? Uh, I don't know where that came from. And how many times can a patient have a yttrium 90 treatment? Usually two to three on that one. If you have 90, uh, yttrium 90, can you ever have a liver tumors removed? Yeah, uh, you can. Mm -hmm. Phil, why don't you take out the primary if the tumor burden is greater than 60%, or do you? Is that just another old wives' tale? Um, I guess depending on what church you go to, you'd leave it in, but the church I happen to belong to, we take them out. Okay. Um, 
the other advantage is to really evaluate the liver and see can the liver be debulked. Even if you can't do a 70 or 80 percent debulking, perhaps you can do a, even a less than that debulking, which would m perhaps render the liver more amenable to liver-directed therapy, as well as search for extrahepatic disease, as well as, again, get tumor out for some sophisticated studies and analysis to see what other bullet we can put in our gun to go after this with besides weight and worry. Vinick, Sutinib and Infinitor approved for PNETs. Are there situations where you think it's appropriate treatment for carcinoids? I, I think Lowell Anthony got at that. The, uh, the data on the changes in progression-free survival were about 22 percent. These days you can do a whole lot better with, uh, with other therapies. Certainly you can do better with Timidor and Zolota. Uh, with carcinoids than you can do with a fit at all. So I don't think it's going to find a real place. I think people will try it. People do, are going to do that. Do you think it's going to make a difference as to whether you have a well-differentiated, moderately well-differentiated, or not so differentiated? Well, differentiated. Uh, it hasn't been tested under all those circumstances. And it hasn't been tested. Right now there's a combination therapy where it's being tested together with Sanostatin. There's another trial where, where it's being done together with Timidor and Zoloda, another trial in combination with Bevacizumab. Everybody's looking for that little edge that it could get in carcinoid, but that we will hear about down the road. Okay, Filippo, uh, is it possible for a patient to send their records to a specialty team for an evaluation? Should the person spend the money and the time to see a specialty team or should they just try to assume that the specialist will go over their case and render an opinion over the phone? The answer is it depends, <laughs> like most things. Uh, we do that quite a bit, um, give an opinion, to, at least to let the patients know whether it's worth the expense and the time for the trip, uh, because we understand that it's real money that you have to spend to go places when this place is not close to where you are. Um, um, the problem is that sometimes um, you just don't get the whole story from a stack of papers. Uh, obviously, the stack of papers with, without the actual disks and without the actual images is f a very poor utility for us. We really need to see the images. And even then, the images don't tell you the whole story. You still sometimes do need to see the patient uh, to uh, assess um, what the total um, options might be, whether they're surgical or medical or some combination. Um, Doctor, I just need one minute. An attritional assessment is somewhere along the way needs to happen because that really goes into my in kind of internal computer when I'm assessing risk, <laughs> trying to recommend a, one therapy over another. Uh, patients that are poor nutritional status are going to be a poor surgical risk and have an increased likelihood of complications such as infections and poor wound healing and stuff like that. And I got to tell you, I can't, uh, Dr. Vinick says, uh, he writes me a n little note, says, Doctor, I just need a minute of your time. And, and, they, and they then want, wonder why you get a worthless piece of caca uh, <laughs> opinion from the doc. You can't do this in a minute. It takes hours of time and I can't bill for it. There's no way for me to bill for that. And if, if I did that for everybody, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have time to see patients. But, but uh, the, the, re the real thing is, is I gotta tell you how many times I've talked to a patient on the phone, looked over their chart, and, and they come in and the first thing I, I see is they're bright red like a lobster. And I say, how often do you flush? I don't flush. I say, look in the mirror. Oh, that's, I'm always that color. And then, then you look at their face and they have all these little blood vessels on their face called telangiectasia. They've got no clue they're flushing. Their wife and their husband hasn't seen them not flush for 20 years. And, and until I see them in my office, nobody else has picked up the fact that they flush. Anyhow, so if you can afford it, if you can get it done, go see a specialist. You know, it doesn't have to be the LSU team. It could be Dr. Vinick, it could be Dr. Odorizio, it could be Dr. Wallen, Dr. Warner. There are a lot of people who are specialists. But we're the second team. <coughs> second team, well, or third, but uh, we won't say. It's that South African soccer team thing. Oh, how do we know if our doctors or labs are using ISI or other approved assays, and how do we get them to use ISI or Quest? 
Uh, turns out that in the old days, if anybody knows me, I, re I recommended Quest out the yin yang. Now I've stopped using Quest because they're using what I think is a subpar laboratory to do the pancreastatins and neurokinins, and that's Cambridge. Right. And I don't tr trust Cambridge farther than I can throw it. I'll give you an example this week. I saw a guy, neurokinin 13, neurokinin 12, neurokinin 13, neurokinin 12, all done by ISI. Gets one sent to Cambridge, 113. Panic value, the guy is like clutching his chest with chest pain. I say, do not worry, we'll send it to ISI, 14. So it, you, I just don't trust it. How do you know, you get your doctor to give you the damn uh, laboratory result sheet and it will say right on there who did the assay. Cambridge, uh, uh, you know, Cambridge or ISI or Ohio State for, uh, for pancreastatin. Uh, and if it's Mayo Clinic, it'll say who, who do they send it out to. If it's Quest, they'll tell you who they send it out to. I send all my stuff now to LabCorp. Okay, because LabCorp will send it to ISI. So that, that's uh, that. Uh, Dr. Vinick, uh, I've been treated for rosacea for 30 years, shortly after getting out of the Navy, was off the coast of Vietnam, exposure to Agent Orange and asbestos. Would this exposure contribute to carcinoid or carcinoid syndrome? Uh, I get lots of people refer to me who have been exposed to Agent Orange, and a lot of things uh, 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 have been uh, implicated, but probably not rightfully so, as uh, due to Agent Orange. I see people who have nerve damage, skin rashes, liver dysfunction, and so forth. It's, it's been very difficult to nail that association, and uh, I doubt that you'd be able to attribute rosacea to the use of Agent Orange as well. That's not to say it doesn't do that, but it's not been shown to be so uh, in any decent studies. And I see this all the time for people who come in uh, saying they've been exposed uh, and they think everything relates to that, but it's been very hard to prove. Uh, Phil, do you have carcinoid syndrome? If you don't have diarrhea, abdominal pain, you do have slight warm feeling, sometime with red eyes, no skin color change. Is that carcinoid syndrome or is that something like histamine release or allergies or something like that? Uh, once again, the answer is it depends. Um, carcinoid syndrome is a gamut of things, and some people have the full-blown syndrome with flushing, diarrhea, wheezing, hot flashes, you name it, palpitations. <clears throat> Other patients have very little symptoms, just a little bit of skin changes. Uh, it's, it's not just the skin changes that tells you you have syndrome or not. You really need to demonstrate some kind of a marker that's elevated that's been shown to be associated with some syndromic manifestation, whether it's serotonin, whether it's gastrin, whether it's some other amine or peptide that is known to be produced by one of these tumors. So um, it's, it's absolutely possible that that can be the only manifestation of the syndrome, and we see probably a lot of what I call form frust, uh, incomplete syndrome, not full-blown, just a little bit of one aspect of the syndrome or another. So you don't have to have all the parts to have syndrome. Would you say that's about right? Uh, may I just... Uh, please, uh, uh, hop right in. I, we're I, we're I, doing I think, good on time. We have a half hour and we got about uh, 10 more of these. Okay. I, I think this is very important. Uh, we see a lot of patients who refer to us because they have one portion of the syndrome, maybe warmth or maybe heat. Or uh, diarrhea, uh, just or, diarrhea. Or just diarrhea. So then the question becomes, what, what else could be carcinoid or carcinoid-like? And I'll tell you the common ones. The one that I mentioned to you earlier today, a majorly carcinoma of the thyroid. So a calcitonin needs to be measured in cases like that so that you don't make that mistake. That's very important. The second thing is, is they may not tell you, but they, they get a little bit of itching, they get a bit of urticaria, and that is due to histamine excess. It produces a very similar clinical syndrome, and you can get a, a urinary tryptase or a blood histamine value, and it will help you make that diagnosis, and the treatment is very easy once you recognize the syndrome. A third one that, that is referred to me very often are people who have diabetes, and a third of our patients, I told you earlier today, have diabetes. They get this feeling of warmth, particularly if they drink red wine, blue cheese, hot dogs, uh, uh, dark chocolate, uh, and dried fruit. We'll do exactly that, and those are the people often that have mild diabetes or metabolic syndrome, or they're en route to develop it, and they have in, uh, disturbance in their autonomic nervous system. They have an imbalance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic, and they just kick it off like that, so they feel hot. 
very easy to do that. They get a fasting and a postprandial blood glucose, and we do an autonomic function, and we can separate those out. I'd say about half the people who refer to me query carcinoid actually turn out to be evolving, uh, to be evolving diabetes or diabetic syndromes. So what, those are some of the things. One more thing. Use of proton pump inhibitors makes your gastrin skyrocket. Gastrin causes flushing. Gastrin causes diarrhea. So if, you, if you're on high, high doses of proton pump inhibitors for a long period of time and you've, it, you, your face is red and you're pooping your brains out, think of, about trying to get off of the proton pump inhibitors for a while and see what happens. Uh, okay, what are the long-term effects of sandostatin and LAR? Um, mild diabetes waste, waste and, and glucose intolerance, development of, of uh, uh, gallstones. Um, it, some people get arthropathy and, and myopathy, your uh, bone pain and, and uh, muscle pain. Uh, those are the biggies. Should you be doing more alternative types of treatment? Uh, that's sort of like saying, should you have more loving? Yes. Uh, you know, uh, it all depends. You know, people in general get their advice about alternative medicine therapies from the, the high school dropout down at the GNC store. And, and it, the answer to that question is no. If you tell me you're going to Dr. Mary Hardy uh, at the University of California, Los Angeles, who's a, a, a legitimate researcher in alternative therapies, I'm all for it. I, I'll give you her phone number. She's a great lady. So uh, again, there's a way big difference between the GNC high school dropout and somebody who does this. And there are now residencies for alternative therapies in the United States. And those pe people are serious clinicians. Uh, is there a higher risk of taking birth control on LAR? I don't know the answer to that, but I don't think so. Uh, Arthur, here we go. Um, uh, there was one that was right up your alley. Um, are NETs hereditary? Uh, who should be tested? What tests should be done? And when should your children be tested? Okay. Uh, NETs may be hereditary. The, the following examples. The first is uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. So if a person has pituitary, parathyroid, and pancreas, the three Ps over there, you think MEN1. It's very easy to get the gene done today. It's on the 11th chromosome, so you get the MEN1 gene. Some people call it the menin gene. It's autosomal dominant. 50% of people will get the syndrome. So it means that if you are prone to have it, you screen every member of your family in childhood. So that's when? Your How old are the children? Uh, the, the, the moment you feel comfortable to doing the tests. Okay, so the five or six, four or five? Yeah, four or five years of age, okay. you do the test. Will it affect their insurance rates? Uh, it will affect their insurance rates, but it may also save their lives. So send them under a bogus name. Your children are Fifi Latul and Ra Rex the Wonder Dog. That way, they'll never know that it's uh, there for the insurance company. Right. And you'll know. And you'll know. And, the, and pay for the test yourself. And pay for the test yourself. For, God, uh, for God's sakes. I mean, th this is a real serious problem. The women who got tested for BRCA1 can't get insured by anybody. So had they sent their name in, it's like the old HIV test. The, the gay folks learn very quickly to get their HIV test set under the name Rakshwat Ralu, you know, <laughs> and, and so they called back to the clinic next week and got, knew that they were HIV positive, but nobody else knew other than them. And so their insurance rates, and they didn't cancel their life insurance and, and all those kind of things. So send your, your children's name under totally bogus names. You turn the camera send, off, right? All right. <laughs> And so the second situation where you encounter this where it's important to get the gene done uh, uh, is related to the m multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. Yeah. I don't like Dr. Wenke in that. Is that him? Okay. Oh. The second situation. And, and those, the situation there is if people have hypertension, pheochromocytoma, caffeole spots that you, that you can recognize as well, uh, they have hyperparathyroidism and they have all oh, multiple endocrine neoplasia. You need to screen for RET proto oncogene. RET proto oncogene. It's also familial, it's also autosomal dominant, but the good thing about that is 
people with red proto-oncogene positivity respond very dramatically to tyrosine kinase inhibitors. That's how we came to treat pheochromocytomas and, and medullary carcinoma with that. So you, once you've established it. The third is a familial form of carcinoid. If you have more than one person in a family with carcinoid, a new gene has been identified. Uh, and uh, so you, you, you may want to find out where to go for these. Uh, we could list those for you and tell you where you can get the various things done. So MEN1 gene, red proto-oncogene, familial carcinoid gene, those are the three genes. The last one I told you has just been done at Hopkins. That was uh, the, uh, uh, the, it's not available uh, in the public domain, and apparently it's inordinately expensive right now, and it's the, the days are too early, three genes. Uh, Chromogran and A test is positive, 5-HIA is negative, how is this reconciled? That's pretty damn easy. Some tumors make serotonin, some tumors don't. If you don't make serotonin, you don't have 5-HIA, but you still got a tumor, and it can make chromogranin. Um, what's the but, best but, way? But they're false positives for chromogranin. And yeah, and false that's false. what I keep talking about, pro, uh, proton pump inhibitors. Most common cause of a positive chromogranin A in America today is proton pump inhibitor use, antacid use. And severe hypertension and renal insufficiency will all produce elevation in chromogranulite. Phil, what's the best way to find an unknown primary if you got METs in the liver? Put the tube in from this end and the one from this end until they meet, right? Well, <laughs> nowadays, um, the, the th in general, the, the three places that these things go to to get to the liver, where they come from is the question, oh. right? So it's going to be lung, it's going to be pancreas, it's going to be somewhere in the gut in general. For some reason, the liver seems to be a preferred location for metastatic okay. spread. So lung, you need a real good bronchoscopy, uh, and that's one of the ways we can find it. You can also do endobronchial ultrasound, which is a very sophisticated way of finding subtle small lesions that are under the mucosa and too small to see. Four gut tumors of the stomach and pancreas, a very sensitive way for finding these small tumors that are not evident on ordinary scans like CT scans and Octrea scans and so forth and MIBG scans are, again, endoscopic ultrasound. Very sensitive way for picking up. It's probably going to be the new standard for evaluating pancreatic, duodenal, and gastric tumors. Between the end of the stomach after the duodenum and the beginning of the colon is the problem area. Colonoscopy can evaluate most of the colon, and you can also do endorectal ultrasound for picking up rectal lesions, very sensitive. The problem is between the, where the small bowel starts and ends, that 30 feet or so of in between intervening small bowel. Small bowel enteroscopy is probably the best, what I would call, not, not exactly non-invasive, but lesser invasive methodology for finding a tumor. The problem is they're still submucosal. So if they're in the wall of the bowel, and here's the tumor, and you're looking in the lumen, you don't see anything. If you look on the outside with a laparoscope, you still don't see anything. But if you feel the bowel with your fingers, you feel a lump. Anybody who's ever thought of being a surgeon understands very quickly the best scan in the world is called the hand scan. God has never created a tool a man has never created a tool as sensitive as the hand to feel small tumors. You can feel routinely one and two millimeter tumors in the bowel wall with your hand, and there is no test other than your fingers that's going to do that. Okay, uh, one more question. Are those that have or have had nets excluded from being a donor for all organs and tissue upon death? The answer is yes, except cornea. Uh, will Kenner have uh, yttrium 90 in 2002? Will Dr. Waldering run for the Republican Party? Uh, maybe. Will a transplant be approved for carcinoid patients since there are so few organs? And I think we heard today the answer to that question is yes. Case by case. Please. It's a case by case thing. And they, they've had to hire... I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I was really impressed. I mean, these guys have a, a multi-bazillion dollar operation. I was fortunate enough to be asked to be a, a guest lecturer there. And, and they have hired their own lobbyist to go and, and lobby against insurance companies 
and lobby for people with neuroendocrine tumors. I think that's pretty cool. Um, it's also a Phil, how can you tell where a primary tumor begins? Uh, and how do you know, and, and I get this question all the time, how do you know a tumor is a primary or a met? Uh, one of the, 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 the person who wrote this, uh, implies that, you know, if, if your tumor is in the liver and their doctor is telling you your liver tumor is a primary tumor, uh, you know, why does that sound ludicrous? Um, there are a condition called the primary neuroendocrine tumors of the liver that are extremely rare. What we don't know for a fact is whether they were just the primary tumor was never found and misdiagnosed, and so by exclusion we say, okay, it started in the liver. It probably does occur, but it's probably really rare. Um, the, we kind of go through a process of elimination. Again, if you know enough about the tumor's cell type and cell type of or, origin, now one of the things that's kind of new on the horizon is a new way of handling the biopsy. And again, it, it goes back to looking for specific markers in the cell types. I think it's biotheranostics, is that the one I'm thinking uh -huh. about? And they can give you a percent likelihood of tissue of origin, whether it's pancreatic or gut, for instance. So that would give you a place to start looking if it's a greater percent of the cells look like they might have be first cousins to something that came from the pancreas, like an islet cell tumor, then you'd want to concentrate on really examining the pancreas very carefully with uh, endoscopic ultrasound, sometimes intraoperative ultrasound, sometimes angiography. Uh, lots of different techniques used to really get some sophisticated images of the pancreas. Uh, if it's looking more like it's of an enteric origin, then you have to look in both ends with a scope. If you have access to small bowel enteroscopy, that's really nice. Uh, sometimes you just have to go to do it the old-fashioned way and go to the operating room. More questions if they got Okay. Does that answer the question, kind of, sort of? Okay, great. Uh, if, uh, uh, Vinick, if somebody you know has carcinoid symptoms, What's the, uh, what are the basic tests to recommend to Dr. Schmo, your family doctor, to diagnose carcinoid? The, uh, I still do a panel uh, to be sure that I'm dealing uh, with it. So the panel that I will have is I do serotonin, and I know it's been poo-pooed in the past, but you've heard today that it's, that it's, it's a good measurement we should make. I still do 5-hydroxy and all acetic acid. I think it's a good measure. If I think it's coming from the foregut based upon the symptom complex, then I get 5-hydroxy tryptophan. I will always get neurokinin, and I'll always get pancreastatin, and I'll always get chromogranin. That's the panel that I use. Substance right P in, in there and, anywhere? And if as uh, the, uh, that you brought up earlier, that you have symptoms that you think that you may have carcinoid and all the other markers are negative, but there's a prominent feature of flushing or diarrhea. I, I get calcitonin gene-related peptide, that's CGRP and substance P, in addition to the other measures. Okay, uh, we're getting close to the end. Be thinking about questions. We're gonna have about 10 minutes left. I'm gonna ask people to stand up and ask their questions. Two tumor, or two questions that probably may be out of the scope of, of the guys up here. They have to do with high-grade, poorly differentiated tumors and treatment options. I mean, clearly sm what they call small blue cell tumors, which are the, the small cell variant of neuroendocrine tumors, the bad guys, the guys that have high KI-67s, are routinely most commonly treated with chemotherapy. What particular chemotherapy has a lot to do with what doc is treating you? Uh, and there is a far less, in other words, uh, the things like Affinitor, the things like Sutent are not commonly used. Things like PRRT that are commonly used for the low grade, well differentiated things are not used as commonly in the high grade. The high grade, there are not, not a lot of options other than chemotherapy. Surgery is used to get tumor tissue to confirm the, the diagnosis and to test for sensitivities to chemo or whatever occasionally. Uh, m there are centers that specialize in poorly differentiated tumors 
uh, those, those centers are usually those people with medical oncology uh, guys on, in their team. All right, any questions from the audience? One over there. Right. right. That's right. Um, she was in her 80s and she was starting to pass. Mm. But um, my son, who's 14, two years ago has been having the same symptoms as stomach aches. You know, stomach aches in kids yeah. are about as common as ear aches in kids. Right. Okay, so that wouldn't of itself bother me. Okay, it wouldn't. The, the odds are overwhelmingly in your favor. Let's look at the, the, the personal nature of this. My mom had carcinoid. Have I gone out and had all kinds of testing myself, or have I got any of my children tested? The answer is no. That's what I did personally. So I think the, the odds are pretty damn rare. Right. Probably incredibly rare. Uh, the, the, you know, the issue with, with uh, w a regard to whether you should have the gene analysis done, if this was like the multiple endocrine neoplasia gene, which is it's, it's set in stone, or the red proto gene, it's set in stone, there's, there's no doubt about that. The genes that have been associated with familial carcinoid are not so clear cut. They've been right. done in research labs. They don't give you a yes, no answer. They give you a maybe answer. So you're not going to get that. So even if you wanted to track that down, you're not going to get that. So you, what you really need to do is bide your time and wait and see how, how that and, pans out. And one of the places that's currently doing a study about familial carcinoid mm -hmm. that you may want to talk to is Dr. Stephen Wank at the NIH. Right. And Dr. Wank is running a, a, a carcinoid hereditary, <laughs> excuse me, carcinoid uh, program that, that you may be able to send a tube of blood in and be included in that study. Okay, the, we're gonna uh, you know, have a little silent auction here. Anybody want to bid large bucks to ask one last question? There she is, good. How, how much? <laughs> yeah, large bucks, yeah, large bucks for the last question of the meeting. Go ahead, you can buy us all a coat no, we, next We're teasing you, we're teasing you. Please go ahead. My condolences. Jesus, can I come sit at your table? <laughs> I, I'm coming. I, don't move over, boys. Yeah, really. I'm <laughs> not happy as I would be. Uh, so you, the guys can't gain weight. And they've all three had bowel resections. Okay. Uh, have you talked to a dietitian, nutritionist? And, and what have they recommended? What? Protein, Genpep, Zenpep, okay. No, well, Zenpep is just a pancreatic. A pancreatic replacement enzyme. Yeah. You're on octreotide? Somatulene Depot. You're on a somatostatin analog? You're on a somatostatin analog? And, and l let's ask, uh, how tall are you? Five foot eight, uh, you're over 140 pounds? You're under 140 pounds. How much? 134. So you're essentially an ideal body weight. Yeah, okay. What about you? How tall? So you're actually 13 pounds overweight. Uh, what about you? Yeah, you're, you're, you're on the low side. So you're a little bit low, you're a little bit low, and, and, and you're probably right on. So uh, again... Uh, do, do they, are they getting you to eat six small meals a day? Are they trying to get your caloric value up? Well, I, I'll add just a little bit to this, okay. if, I, if I may. So, so what I was telling you earlier on is that uh, when we're using some of the newer drugs, we're actually creating testosterone deficiency. So one of the uh, requests you make of your physician is to get a testosterone value. And to, uh, that what it means is that you're losing muscle mass. 
and uh, I need to have had the testosterone replaced, then that's very easy to do. So I would get a testosterone measured if, if this is what you're thinking Are you of. using the gels or are you Andrew using gel. the injection? Androgel. Androgel. I just mean, on the, in the yeah. old days, the, the testosterone was given as an IM injection in your butt, and it hurt like a son of a big, uh, so that nobody would use it. Now the androgel, you just you smear on your skin, and it goes right through the skin like it's not there. So you can replace your testosterone very easily in the privacy of your own bathroom rather than having to go get your butt shot up with the, the testosterone. And it, it's a big issue. I mean, uh, the, the number of people who are testosterone deficient, guys, uh, is, is really very scary. Right, and especially as you get older, it's very hard It's hard to actually get the testosterone up, so it's worth measuring. The second thing I tell you is a trick that I use in the clinic a lot, is I use periactin, periactin. It's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and it uh, actually stimulates Gives you the, the munchies. Gives you the munchies. Hmm? It worked. There you go. You hear that? From, from, yeah, periactin from is, is one of those jo uh, drugs that I never need to see. <laughs> but, but it's very useful, a small yeah. dose. Yeah, Goodyear sent me a new sw a silver swimming suit for the summer with Goodyear down the side, so I don't, I'm not doing periactin. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. You've been a great audience. We'll see Thanks, some of you in Dallas.